The text for this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 9, namely the verses 6 and 7. I'll read those verses once more. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So far the text. After the sermon, we'll sing hymn 19, 1 through 4. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, the news is filled with news about war. All you need to do is turn on the news and you'll hear about war in the Middle East and war in Eastern Europe, Israel and Hamas, Russia and Ukraine. And I think that if we all think back, we'll have to say that there was no time in our lives that we never heard about war on the news. It's one of my earliest memories. I remember when I was growing up, we listened to 900 CHML in Hamilton around supper time. We turned on the news and I can still remember as a little boy that I heard about fighting in the Middle East, Israel at war with its neighbors and its neighbors at war with Israel. And those of you who are much older than me will even have memories of World War II. You lived through it as boys and girls, that tense time. And the United Nations, which was established to bring an end to war, has not been very successful. There are wars throughout the world, and there's so much loss of life, so much destruction, so much heartache and anguish, death all around, and those who are not killed are maimed, and if they are not physically harmed, they are mentally harmed. Now this morning we're going to listen to this text, which is about peace. It almost seems a little bit strange. And yet it's beautiful. Because here is hope for the world. The text is about the promised child, the prince of peace, who will establish peace. In the face of military oppression, the prophet Isaiah prophesies about the coming kingdom of peace. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning in this world filled with so much war and death. The prophet Isaiah prophesies about the coming kingdom of peace. And as we focus on that, we'll know three things. The text speaks to us about the essence of this peace. Secondly, the extent of this peace. And thirdly, the effect of this peace. Today we we live in a world with some superpowers. Russia and China are the superpowers of our day. And then there are also other nations that may not be superpowers, but they certainly fill the world with a lot of dread. What are they going to do next? What crazy ideas are going to get into their heads? Well, in Isaiah's day, there was also a superpower. And that was Assyria. And all the nations were afraid of Assyria. If you read the preceding chapters in the prophecies of Isaiah, you'll know that Israel and Judah were afraid of the Assyrians. And Judah was threatened by Israel, the northern kingdom, and Syria. They were going to launch another attack. So the Lord said to Judah, 
The Lord said to King Ahaz of Judah, you can read that in chapter 7, that Judah did not have to worry. The Lord would take care of Judah. Syria and Ephraim would not conquer Judah. But King Ahaz didn't believe the Lord because he didn't believe the Lord's word. He was not interested in the service of the Lord. He was an evil king. And then the Lord said that the very people that Ahaz would look to for help would be the people who would overrun Judah. Ahaz was going to look to Assyria, that superpower for protection, rather than to the Lord. And the Lord said that he was going to shave Judah like a razor. And all the hair would be taken from Judah's body. The Lord said that it would be like the river Euphrates overflowing its banks and flooding the land and coming right up to the neck of Judah. That means it was going to come right up to the capital city, Jerusalem. But they would not be able to take it. But there would be deep darkness in the land and anguish. And Ephraim, the northern kingdom, was going to be completely overrun by the Assyrians. And they would be taken into exile by the Assyrians. And Israel, the northern kingdom, was going to be plunged into deep darkness. And then we have this text, this passage. It's remarkable that the Lord focuses in this passage on the northern kingdom. Isaiah was a prophet sent to work primarily among Judah. But here in this passage, the Lord's attention is toward Israel, the northern kingdom. And that's because the Lord could not forget his people entirely. And the first part of the northern kingdom that was going to experience the Assyrian oppression, Zebulun and Naphtali, would be the first part of the northern kingdom to experience the light. So we read in Isaiah chapter 9 verse 1, There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. That was way up in the northern kingdom. The Lord turns his attention to them. And then he says in verse 2, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. And what would bring them light? Deliverance and peace. That's what we read in the verses 4 and 5. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. There would be peace. And what is the essence of this peace? What is it all about? Well, that's where our text comes into the picture. Notice that our text begins with that little word for. That indicates a reason. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the remainder of our text. A Savior was going to come. Someone who would establish peace forever. And you understand from the magnitude of our text that our text rises above the Assyrian situation. And this child of whom is spoken in our text rises above the level of the normal. Isaiah is prophesying about the coming Savior. And we know that very clearly from what we read in the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew chapter 4, 12 through 17, we read this. Now when he, that is Christ, heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulon and Naphtali 
so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you know the Gospels a little bit, you know that the Lord Jesus spent a tremendous amount of time in Galilee, in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. That's where he preached the Gospel of the kingdom. And what is that gospel about? That gospel is about the fact that he came into the world to be the savior of fallen mankind. That he came into the world to lay down his life to pay the price for people's sins. That he came into the world to fulfill all righteousness for people. To do the things that we fail to do. To be that perfect man for us. To save us. And then to die on the cross for our sins. But on the third day be raised up again to life as the victor over sin, Satan, and death. In that way, congregation, the Lord Jesus laid the foundation for that kingdom of peace. He brought about reconciliation between God and man. And Isaiah presents all of this in the language of his time. He talks about the Assyrians as the oppressor. He talks about the tramping warrior and battle tumult. He talks about the yoke and the burden. But we know that the Assyrians represented, ultimately, the bondage of sin. Just like in the days of Moses, the Egyptians represented the bondage of sin. And when the Lord led his people Israel out of the slavery of Egypt, that foreshadowed the fact that he was going to one day lead his people out of the slavery of sin. And that's what the Son of God came to do. And this is the depth of our text. And listen to these wonderful names that we find in our text. We read there about the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace. Now, if you were to study the book of Isaiah a little bit, you would find that those first three names for this child are, are terms used elsewhere in Isaiah for God. So by describing this child in this way, Isaiah is implying that this child to be born is divine. This child is above the level of the ordinary. There's something very special about this child. And I'm not going to go through all those texts this morning. That would become too tedious. But this child is divine. And that has wonderful implications for us. Wonderful counselor. He will be filled with the spirit of God. And as the apostle Paul says in Colossians chapter 2. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Jesus Christ. Everything that you need to know. For life and eternity can be found in Jesus Christ. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God. That means that. By the power of his divine nature, he can bear in his human nature the burden of God's eternal wrath against our sins. It took the power of God to carry the wrath of God against our sins. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. This child, this Savior, would be as an eternal father to his people. Always taking care of his people. Always providing us with all things necessary for body and soul. Everlasting Father. And then it culminates with Prince of Peace. 
He would establish peace by reconciling fallen man to the holy God. Prince of peace. He would satisfy the justice of God by paying the price for our sins. Because sin committed against the most high majesty of God must be punished. And it was punished in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And that's why Isaiah can prophesy that this would be a kingdom established and upheld with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. And the Lord Jesus as our eternal king, upholds that kingdom with justice and righteousness. He rules the nations with justice and righteousness. Now this is the wonderful gospel that Isaiah could prophesy in his day. And he presented here something which is the solution for all the wars and all the misery in this fallen and broken world. A savior was needed, something above the ordinary, something above what man can deliver. And the text ends by saying, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. It takes the zeal of the Lord, his love for his people, then and now. The zeal of the Lord will do this. There is a reference in the preceding verses to the day of Midian. Maybe you know that story. Maybe the kids know that story. Gideon was to go out with 300 men of Israel. And the Lord used those 300 men of Israel to defeat the Midianites. It was a very miraculous visit. I doubt that any military strategist would use that kind of an approach today. It was supernatural. It was beyond human Ability. That's why it's referred to here as the day of Midian. And when Isaiah prophesies here about the yoke and the staff and the rod being broken as on the day of Midian, Isaiah was prophesying about the fact that the burden and the yoke of sin would be broken in the most miraculous way. Just as God allowed the Israelites to conquer the Midianites long ago. It was something supernatural. This is why the Apostle Paul writes that what God has done for us in Jesus Christ is something that no human mind could ever have conceived of. It did not come from us. Our salvation does not come from us. It comes from God, as in the day of Midian. To think that God would send His only begotten Son into the world to lay down His life for us and to save us is something that only God could plan and execute. The zeal of the Lord will do it. And he did. The world today tries so very hard to establish peace. There are peace talks. There's the United Nations. There are people who intervene. Try as hard as the world tries, the world does not succeed in establishing lasting peace. Most normal people want peace, but we can't achieve it. What it takes is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. Jesus Christ is a prince of peace. And what it takes for peace to take root in this world is for the gospel of Jesus Christ to spread to the ends of the earth. That's the only hope this world has. And that's why we engage in mission and evangelism. That people may come to know that only name given under heaven among people by which we must be saved, the name of Jesus. Because when people come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, that changes their lives. That's also why the Apostle Paul says in his letter to Timothy, we are even to pray for those in positions of authority, that we may lead quiet and peaceful lives. So we pray for a man like Putin, as much as we might dislike him. 
We pray that the Holy Spirit will work in his heart, that he will experience a change. And don't think that that cannot happen. If God could convert you, then God can convert anybody. And as the gospel of Jesus Christ spreads and people come to know Christ as Savior, it will lead to peace in their lives. It's not for nothing that we sing that Christmas hymn, God and Sinners Reconciled. Well, that reconciliation between God and man also leads to reconciliation between man and his fellow man. There's no hope for peace in this world where the gospel of Jesus Christ does not reach. But where the gospel of Jesus Christ makes inroads in people's lives, there's hope for harmony and peace. That's why the church is such a special place. It is a special place, and the church should act like a special place because the church is the microcosm of the new earth. The new earth in miniature. In advance, so to speak, this is where it starts. And I know that we confess with the Heidelberg Catechism that even the holiest have only a small beginning of this obedience, but it is a beginning. And in the church, we need to see a beginning of that peace between one another. If a church is always at odds with one another, if a church is racked by acrimony and fighting, and I'm not saying that that's what's happening here, but that does happen in certain places, that's a terrible thing. Because a church should be the place where there is that foretaste of the new earth, where there will be only peace. And the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world to establish that peace. And wherever his name goes and is received in faith, there's a beginning of that peace. And after the Lord Jesus finished the work he came to do, he ascended into heaven, he took his seat at the Father's right hand, he rules the kingdom, his name goes out, people embrace the name, it makes a difference in their lives, and the Lord Jesus will one day return, and he will inaugurate that kingdom of peace in all its glory, and then there will be no more war, no more death, only peace. No death, no mourning, no tears. No darkness, only peace, only harmony, only love, only light. Isaiah also prophesies about the extent of this, and we find that in verse 7, two phrases, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. That's the first thing. And the second thing, from this time forth and forevermore. That reference to increase indicates a geographical extent. It's all comprehensive, worldwide. The Lord Jesus is on the throne in heaven today, ruling and governing. And the gospel goes out, people come to faith makes a difference in their lives, and one day Christ will return, and his peace will fill the whole earth. This is the gospel for the nations. And the other thing is about enduring time. From this time forth and forevermore, as Peter says in his second letter, the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The eternal kingdom. That's what people want. Peace. Peace forever. And the gospel holds it out. The eternal kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. A never-ending peace. That you never have to worry that war will be again. Everlasting peace. 
because it's an everlasting kingdom. Because Jesus Christ is an everlasting king. What does that do for us? Isaiah prophesies about the effect of this peace. What does it do for us? Well, look at verse 6. It begins with that little word, for. For to us a child is born, and then follows everything in our text. That indicates that our text is the reason for something. And then look back at verse 3, where Isaiah prophesies, You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. It's a beautiful verse. So many different words here for joy. So many different times that the word joy or rejoicing or glad are mentioned. So that tells us that the effect of the wonderful gospel of our text is joy. Does it do that for you? Advent is a season of joy. There's a reason why there are so many concerts at this time of year. Maybe you were at a concert this past week. Last night I was at Handel's Messiah. It was wonderful to hear this morning's text sung. It's a season of joy. And we express our joy in singing. Isaiah holds out hope for Zebulun and Naphtali. If Zebulun and Naphtali would embrace Jesus Christ in true faith when the Lord Jesus was working among them, they would have joy. But so many didn't. They rejected him. If we embrace Jesus Christ in faith, we have joy. And whoever embraces Jesus Christ in faith today will have joy. That's the wonderful news that comes to us in our text. We have reason for joy in a fallen and broken world. When you turn on the news, you have so much reason for sadness. Maybe you even turn off the news because you can only take so much of it. We live in this fallen and broken world and we hear news filled with news of war and death and destruction. But the Christian still has reason for joy. Because we know the name of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, and that gospel about the kingdom of peace gives us joy in this fallen and broken world. Amen.